All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, we've been preaching a series on the last days. <coughs> Lord willing, we're going to preach tonight about the opening of the seals. That sealed book. Revelation chapter 4. All right, hopefully you found it by now. It's not too hard to find the book of Revelation. Just turn to the back. Now don't read, start reading the concordance. Make sure it says Revelation. But here we go in verse 1. It says, After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, and said, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was the look upon like a jasper or a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in a white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne uh, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four uh, beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the beast was, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast like the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings around about him, and they were full of eyes within, and rest not day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me as I stand before your congregation tonight. I pray, Lord, you'd help me to stand in the power of the Spirit of God. I pray that you'd lead me in what I should say and not say. And Lord, I pray that you'd make this sermon tonight a blessing to everybody that hears it. And we ask these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. Now, as we went to this, delved into this series on the last days, we started out talking about the climate of the last days. And we determined as we looked at uh, what uh, the book of Timothy said about the last days, that we're living in those days. The Bible says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents. The list went on and on, and we determined we must be in the last days. Right. Of course, we are in the last days because it was the last days when Jesus came down to earth. But if we're in those parts of the last days, we're in the end of the last days. Right. We also looked at the first resurrection where the saints of God will be caught up into the sky to meet the Lord in the air. We studied 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and saw that. And I praise God that one of these days I'm going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. Whether I be alive at His coming or whether I be absent from the body present with the Lord, I'll be called up together with all the saints of God to that grand reunion up in the sky. Amen. We also talked about those last week that were left behind. Those who were unsaved, they're left behind and they're going to endure the worst time that's ever been upon the face of the earth, which is the tribulation period, which I hope to get to uh, tonight. But here in our text, we read about how John was called up into the third heaven when God said, come up hither. Now, I don't know whether he was called up in the body or whether he was just called up in the spirit, but he was called up with those words, come up hither. I believe certainly this, this pictures the rapture of the church that will come one day. I believe that's what I'll hear. I'll hear a trumpet and maybe God say, come up hither before I'm called up to witness the same things that John saw in this vision. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 teaches the fact of the resurrection. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and through teaches us about the transformation of that that rapture of the church, that catching away. I find it very interesting when we read the book of Genesis before the flood. Before the flood, Enoch walked with God and he was not. Enoch was taken. Likewise, the church will be taken before God judges the earth the second time. 
Also, uh, Noah and his family went inside the ark and they endured that storm and God protected them. I believe that also is a picture of Israel whom God will uh, watch out for during the tribulation period, but they'll go through it. The church will not endure the tribulation period. will be called out before like Enoch. I find that very interesting. Christ uses uh, the, uh, the flood as an example of his coming, by the way. Now, uh, John, as he's called up into that third heaven, he sees one that sits on the throne. Amen. Who's likened to look into as a jasper or a sardine stone. I tell you what, the king on his throne will be spectacular to behold. And as I preach this morning, I can't wait to look upon him and see those nail-scarred hands of that that were scarred for me upon Calvary. Amen. But around the throne was a rainbow. And of course, the rainbow is a symbol of, of God's mercy, folks. Don't let anybody hijack that symbol. Right. God showed that rainbow. He said, I'm not going to cause it to rain upon the earth. Right. Right. Amen. It's a symbol of his covenant with his people. Yeah. There's a rainbow around the throne. John saw 24 elders round about that throne. By the way, that's the number of the Levitical order in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Now, I don't believe this is the Levitical order of the Israelites, but I do believe it is a symbolic of a priesthood. Amen. And of course, we know the Christians themselves, the children of God, are kings and priests unto God. Amen. I do not have to confess my sins to some priest in some confessional book. Right. I can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and help in the time of need because I am a priest unto God under the great and holy high priest, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. But these 24 elders, now I don't know exactly who they are. I can speculate, but I'm not going to speculate too much in this sermon. Right. But I do know that they have victor's crowns upon their heads. And they take these victor crowns off of their heads and they cast them before the Savior's feet. As if they were to say, we didn't earn these. We only were able to attain these because of what you did. Amen. They say, thou dost deserve all honor and glory. And they cast those crowns before the Lord's feet. Yes. Now it only tells us that 24 elders do that. But you know what? If I have a crown up in heaven and I plan on having a few... I'm not going to strut around heaven with them. I'm going to take mine off too, and I'm going to lay them at the feet of the one who saved me. Amen. I want to cast the crown before the Lord's feet. I think about what they said when they cast the crown. They said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. For Thy pleasure are they created. And I'll say amen to that. Amen. And if they lift up their voices and say it, I'm going to say it right along with them. He says that John uh, saw in the right hand of him, hand that, of him that sat on the throne a book, meaning a scroll, written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And as uh, that, that, that scroll is being beheld by John, the question is asked, who's worthy to open this book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in the earth, nor under the earth was able to open that book, neither to look thereon. And John says, because of this, he wept a much. And one of the elders comes over to him and puts his hand on his, on his shoulder and says, John, weep not. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. In other words, if you don't know who that is, King Jesus yeah. is able to open that book and to break every single seal. Amen. He is worthy to open that book. He's worthy to open the seals. And he certainly is able to do so also. Now what is this book? Now that's the question. This book is the key which opens the whole book of Revelation, I believe. This little book sealed with seven seals, I believe, contains the redemption terms for the earth. That's where I land on that. Now, Jesus redeemed the soul at Calvary. He bought us with a great price by the sacrifice of himself as he bore our sins in his own body. He bought us at Calvary. I love that where he says later on in the epistles, he says, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. What was that price? Christ's precious blood is what bought me. Amen. Not my own good works. 
Not from out of my own pocketbook. But the Lord Jesus Christ purchased me with his own blood. Amen. It's like what Peter said. Not about... Uh, 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 Peter said, not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but by his precious blood. Amen. Now, he redeems the body at the resurrection. He redeemed our souls at Calvary. He redeems our body at the resurrection. I'm waiting for that redemption. I need that redemption. This old body's wearing out. It's not being redeemed. It's corrupting but one of these days I'll have a body likened to his glorious body. My body will be redeemed. Amen. John knew the prospect of this. And he says uh, that, that, he'd be, that, that we would be adorned with that body. I, I'm thinking of David. David said, I'll be satisfied when I'm like him. Not John. John also looked forward to that body too. He right. says, we will like, be like him or we'll see him as he is. Job said that even though worms eat this body, in my flesh I'll see God. He was looking for that body. The redemption of the body will come one day. But also, not only does Jesus, did Jesus redeem the soul at Calvary, redeem the body at the resurrection, but he redeemed the earth and all creation during this time of the breaking of the seven seals. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 speaks of the redemption of the earth. It says, for we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. It's groaning under a curse. The earth was good when God made it, but man brought a curse upon this world. Christ is going to lift that curse. I believe that's what this book has to do with. Now, let me, let me expand on that a little bit. Now, God gave man dominion over the earth at the beginning. But somehow through the sin of Adam, now that was sold out. Now let me illustrate that. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what did the devil offer to Christ in that second temptation? He took him on top of the, a great mountain and he says, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. If he's able to give those kingdoms, who's in control of those kingdoms? All right, he's called in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this world, talking about the devil. And then in Revelation chapter 11, I believe that's when the seventh trumpet sound, it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. To understand this seven sealed book, we need to go back to the Old Testament. Right. There are many laws and regulations uh, concerning uh, the, the system of laws of, it, the, of Israel. Among these laws, three there are concerning redemption. First of all, there's the law of redemption concerning the wife. Now, to redeem a wife and the possessions that were lost when her husband died, you had to be a kin, you had to be kin to her, or the one that died. You had to have the ability to do so, and you had to be willing to do it. For example, Ruth. We know that Naomi and Abimelech went into Moab, God's wash pot. And while they were there in Moab, God didn't want them there. But while they were there, Elimelech died, Naomi's husband. And then their two children died, Malon and Chilion. That left Naomi and it left Ruth and it left Orpha. All there in uh, Moab. Well, they all decide they're going to go back to Israel, and Orpah decides to stay behind, and then Naomi and uh, Ruth go back. I love what Ruth says. She said, your God will be my God. Amen. Your people will be my people. They go back to Israel, and when they get back to Israel, they find that they have nothing. It was all lost. They had no possessions. But I believe they sought the Lord's face, don't you? Because the Bible says that it was Ruth's hap to land upon Boaz's field. That word hap has written all over it the providence of God. God was working in Ruth's life to get her to that field. And while she's gleaning in that field, Boaz falls in love with her, and Boaz is kin to her husband. And, died. and being kin to her husband, kin to uh, and Naomi's husband also. He starts dropping her handfuls of pur on purpose. I love that. <laughs> Amen. He takes her in. 
He says, I'll buy back all that you lost. Because he's kin, and he has the ability to do so. He's got plenty of money, and he's willing to do it. But before he can do that, he has to go and talk to a nearer kinsman, and he gets permission to be the one who redeems Ruth. Now, I'm not going to go too much into that story past that. But I'm going to say that Jesus became our kinsman redeemer. Amen. He redeemed us. Now we are the bride of Christ. Through Adam we fell and we lost everything. So Christ had to come as a man down to earth to be our kinsman. As God, he could not have died for us. He had to become a man to die for the sins of man. He became our kinsman. Amen. He was able uh, to pay that price because of his perfect and holy life. If Christ had ascended one time, he could not have been our kinsman redeemer. He would have had no coin. But he lived that perfect life and became a sacrifice, and he was willing to do it. You know, he could have called legions of angels uh, to take him down from the cross. He didn't have to go to the cross. But he chose to go to the cross to die for us. He went all the way. He was willing. So there we have the redemption concerning the wife. We also have the law of redemption concerning the slave in the Bible, in the Old Testament. If a man lost all he had and he couldn't pay his bills, a creditor could take him as a slave. And when he had served for six years, on that seventh year, he would be set free. Now he could choose to stay behind and continue to be a slave, but he could be set free after six years if he so cho chose to do so. Now, not only could he be set free after six years, but also somebody could pay his debt and set him free too. Well, that's what Jesus did for us. Adam lost all when he sinned, and thus through Adam we all became slaves to sin. But the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, paid our debt that we owed that we might be free. And after all, Jesus said, if I make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Made us free. That's why he came. Remember when he went to the, the uh, synagogue there? He said, and he read from Isaiah, he read the scriptures that said, I've come uh, to set at liberty those that are bruised. Amen. And preach deliverance to the captives. And that's what he did. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. We were slaves to sin. And then there's a redemption concerning land, which I think has to do with this, this seven sealed book. In Leviticus 25, 23, it says, The land shall not be sold forever. So an Israelite couldn't sell their land and it be gone forever. They, sh they should always be able to buy it back. Well, Adam sold out to the devil, uh, but the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, bought it back with his own blood. What Adam lost, Jesus can buy back. Yep, amen. He became our kinsman, didn't he? Yep. Amen. Now, land can be redeemed in two ways. First of all, by the owner himself. The owner could buy it back. Now, if Naomi's husband would have been alive, he could have bought back the land, but he was dead, so somebody else had to do it, right? Likewise, Adam could not pay the debt that he owed. He was dead. He was a slave to sin. Even after a we, though, had been made free through Christ Jesus, we still can do nothing. We can't afford it. No man could open the seal except for the line of the tribe of Judah who was able. Amen. The owner could do it himself, but we couldn't. Adam couldn't do it, we couldn't do it. We had to have a near kinsman, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Old Testament times, when a man lost his property, he became a slave, and two scrolls were prepared. On these two scrolls were the terms of redemption, and they were written on those scrolls. One scroll was left open in the temple for all people to read who were interested. The other was rolled up and sealed with seven seals which were kept inside the temple until the kinsman could come and redeem each and every point of that contract. He had to be willing to do it and he had to be able to do it. That's why they, the 24 elders and those that are in heaven, that's why us who are redeemed, who will be there also, will sing that new song because the Lamb is able to redeem all things. He redeemed our souls. He'll redeem our bodies. And one of these days, He's going to re redeem all that Adam lost in the fall. Amen. Christ, our kinsman redeemer, has taken the scroll. The first and second redemption happened. Uh, he redeemed us as his bride. And he redeemed us who were slaves. Amen. 
Only the Lamb must be redeemed. That's going to happen here in the book of Revelation. Now, the kingdom follows the, re the tribulation because Christ has to take control of it. The Gentiles have had dominion over the nations of this world. Y'all remember Daniel's dream that he, that he interpreted of Nebuchadnezzar's about that great image? It said, had a head of gold, shoulders of silver, a belly of brass, and legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. That image represented the kingdoms of this world. Starting with the head of gold, that was Nebuchadnezzar and his great kingdom. Right. That's why Nebuchadnezzar later on probably built that image made of all of gold because he said, my kingdom's going to keep on going. Right. And it's pride. But then the shoulders followed after, Medes and the Persians, the belly of bronze, that was uh, Alexander the Great, Greece, legs of iron, the Roman Empire. There's a kingdom that's going to come, the revived Roman Empire, which will be, will be those toes made of iron and clay and amalgamation. But the key there is not that image which represents the nations of mankind. The key is that rock that's cut out without hands in that vision that comes rolling down the mountainside which smites the feet of that image and it turns into dust and then that rock fills the whole earth. That's the kingdom of God. Amen. Christ has taken control. I love that. Now, Daniel chapter 9 speaks of 70 weeks being determined upon God's people. And that's talking about Israel in the Old Testament. We are God's people to also as Christians, folks. But in the Old Testament, he dealt with Israel. Now, he says 70 weeks determined on thy people. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Daniel. Who's Daniel's people? The Israelites are. He says 69 of those weeks have already passed. There's only one week left. And I'm not talking about a week as in Monday through sun, or Sunday through Saturday. I'm talking about a prophetical week that's seven years. There's seven years left in those prophetical weeks prophesied by Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. And those weeks, are, that week is called the time of Jacob's trouble. You know what Jacob's name was turned into after he wrestled with God? Israel. There's seven, there's seven years, one prophetical week left for Israel in those 70 weeks. Now, let me, let me clarify what I'm saying here. 69 weeks have already come to pass. There's one week left. But how come that week has not started? Because there's a church age that has to take place first. That church age has no a numerical ending to it. God didn't, God started it at a certain point, uh, but he says, no man knoweth the day and the hour of the Son of Man cometh, and when the Son of Man cometh, we're going to be caught up into the air, and then the church is going to be gone, and God's going to deal with his people for that one week, that week of Jacob's trouble. The church is gone. You hear what I said? The church is gone. The church will not be here for that tribulation period. Now, so here we go. Let's get into this uh, breaking of the seals. So John sees the Lamb of God take that scroll and he breaks the first seal. When the first seal is broken, the Bible says there was a white horse. And the rider on that white horse had a crown upon his head. He had a bow, but it does not mention any arrows being in that bow. Oftentimes in the scriptures, when you see a bow mentioned, it says bow and arrow, but this does not mention the arrow. He has a bow. And he goes forth conquering this one upon the white horse. Now this rider upon the white horse, don't be confused about this. Jesus does come on a white horse, Revelation 19. But this rider on the white horse is not Jesus. He's the great uh, imitator, the devil himself, the Antichrist. Right. He's going to go forth conquering. There's going to be a man named the Antichrist who will come up on the scene when, after the church is gone. He's going to have an explanation for everything. He is going to conquer not through military might, but through diplomacy. He'll have a crown upon his head. He'll have a power, but he will not exert that power at the first. He'll have an explanation. Most of y'all have heard of the mark of the beast. That's a number that will cause men to take, that they can't buy nor sell. I believe he'll use that 
to gain power. Right. I mean, you start having food shortages. You certainly can get people to take a mark. I tell you what, we've got some similar stuff going on right now. Oh, yeah. So this white, rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm not going verse by verse here. But I personally believe the Antichrist will be a man. But that he'll be assassinated with a deadly head wound. And I believe the devil will inherit his body for the last part of the tribulation, for the last three and a half years. You can believe that or you do not believe that. I don't really care. That's what I believe. But anyway, the second seal is broken. And when the second seal is broken, John said, I saw a rider on a red horse. And he said he had a great sword in his hand, and he took peace from the earth. There is going to be wars and rumors of wars during this tribulation period. There's going to be wars such as were never fought during this time. He said he saw another, the third seal broken, and he saw a black horse. And the rider on the black horse had a pair of balances in his hands. And he said, that, among other things, a measure of wheat for a penny. That's talking about inflation, folks. Now, if you study the whole book of Revelation, you're going to see some great catastrophes take place. A third of the trees will be burned up. All of the, all of the, the third of the sea will be turned into blood, and the things will die in the sea. There's going to be a food shortage. And there's going to be skyrocketing inflation. I find it very interesting that uh, we just keep on printing money here in America. Huh? You know what that causes? Causes inflation, don't it? Yeah. Rider on the black horse. And then the fourth seal is broken. There's a rider on a pale horse. And death and hell followed after him. It says that power is given to this rider upon the pale horse to kill with the sword. That's war. Uh, that's, that's anger. That's violence. With hunger. And with death. That's talking about pestilences. And certainly we are seeing some pestilences today too, aren't we? I tell you what, this book's becoming more and more real as we move along. Amen. I do believe the church has gone before the tribulation period, but that doesn't mean we won't suffer some things before that time happens. Right. And you better be prepared to go through some things. Amen. And he said that, the, they, that with this pale horse, they would also, he would kill with the beast of the earth. It's in chapter 6, verse 8. The animals are going to turn on people. Now, these four horsemen, that, that sounds pretty brutal, doesn't it? I'm glad I'm not going to be here. I'm glad I know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'm glad that I can flee from the wrath to come to the Almighty One and be saved. Yeah. You can be too. Yeah. But then that sixth seal is broken and John says, I saw some souls under the altar who are praying for vengeance. You say, who are those souls under the altar, preacher? That's people who refuse to take that mark of the beast. When the Antichrist says, you're going to have to take this mark to buy or sell because we're in a food crisis, they're going to say, we're not going to take it. Amen. They're going to look to Christ and be saved during, even during this terrible time, and but they're going to be killed for it. Amen. The Bible says that they will be beheaded because they receive not that mark. I find it strange that there's been some beheadings happening here recently. Over in the Middle East, primarily. Beheadings will not be a thing of the past. You'd think we was above that in society, wouldn't you? You know, there's some brutal people still alive. But these people will be slain. And they'll be the souls of They'll cry out for vengeance. I believe that there's a reoccurring theme with these souls under the altar all throughout the book of Revelation. We'll look at that here in a moment. But when the sixth seal is broken, then we're trying to go fast through this. This really deserves more time. Maybe we'll do that some other time. But when the sixth seal is broken, there's physical changes in the earth. There's a great earthquake. The sun is made black. The moon is made as blood. The stars begin to fall to the earth. And that's talking about meteorites. Every mountain and island shall be moved. Now that's a massive earthquake, isn't it? The mountains and islands are moved. I mean, you hear about people all the time talking about the billions of years and so on and so forth and the tectonic plates pushing up the smoky mountains and all that stuff. I don't believe the earth is near that old. 6,000 years, amen. 
but the islands are going to be moved. Those plates are going to be sliding around because the Almighty's finger can push even a mountain. Men will cry for the rocks of the mountains to fall on them and hide their face from him that sat upon the throne. Me and Byerly were talking about this uh, just today. Why do these men uh, continue to turn away from God? Why do they continue to stiffen their necks? They've got to the point where they don't care anymore. I tell you, you better be saved today. Amen. Don't say no to the Holy Spirit. Don't say no to His calling for salvation. Be saved today. But then we read as this sixth seal is being broken uh, that there's a ceiling of 144,000 male Jewish virgins. It's funny to me that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, say that there's 144,000. It's very clear if you read the scriptures uh, that they were from different tribes and they were Israelites. Next time you have a Jehovah's Witness come to your door say, which tribe are you from? Another thing I find very striking about the fact that they claim to be the 144,000 is this, that they were all male. Right. What it says in the Bible, I guess the women Jehovah's Witnesses are out of luck. <laughs> Amen. And they were virgins. How many Jehovah's Witnesses are married? A lot. You're not going to make it in the 144,000 then. The Bible is very clear that this is a Jewish element and this Jewish element they are sealed with a seal in their heads and they go and they preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the world. People receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior during that tribulation due to the preaching of these fellows. Amen. Amen. Now when the seventh seal is broken, the Bible says there's silence in heaven about a half hour. Now, people might say, why was there silence in heaven for a half hour? I heard one preacher say, it proves there's no women in heaven. I don't particularly believe that myself. Brother Hebert seen that come. He was already laughing. But I believe there's silence in heaven because it's a solemn event. I guarantee you as the, the troops, America's troops, were heading over on Operation Overlord to storm the beaches of Normandy, there wasn't a lot of chatterboxes. It was a solemn thing, wasn't it? They were heading there. And they were contemplating what they were going to run into. And I believe that's why they're silence, because there's a great contemplation. Now, with this silence begins the seven trumpets. An angel gets a censer. A censer is what you put incense in to burn them on top of the altar of incense. He fills that censer with the incense from that altar. Now, remember, who's under that altar? According to the breaking of the sixth seal, who was it? The souls that were slain because they refused to the mark. They're under this altar. They're crying out and praying for vengeance. And Christ says, wait a little while. I believe the while's up right here. He fills that censer from that altar and he throws it down to the earth. And with that, the seventh trumpet sounds and there's fire and hail and blood falls down and kills a third of the trees and all the grass. You think there'll be some crops that die in that? Yeah. That's chapter 8, verse 7. There's a burning mountain cast into the sea. Now, I don't really know what this burning mountain is, except for it says it's a burning mountain. But it says because of this burning mountain, when the second trumpet sounds, it says a third of the sea becomes blood, a third of the creatures in the sea die, a third of the ships are destroyed. And can you imagine if a mountain is cast into the water, what's going to happen to the water table? Right. Now, right now, people say climate change. Because climate change, the waters are going to rise. You'll have oceanfront property inland because of climate change. No, what's going to cause uh, water to come inland is this mountain cast into the sea. Right. And if something's cast into the sea, what happens? There's going to be some waves. You've heard of the tsunami? There's already been some earthquakes. Water tables will rise up. Then the third trumpet sounds. A meteorite named Wormwood, a star, uh, comes down. And a third part of the rivers and fountains are poisoned by Wormwood. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with anything. But I, I do know uh, that the, the, the word Wormwood translated in Russian is Chernobyl. That's an interesting thing to know. I don't know if it means anything. But certainly radiation could poison. And uh, radiation comes from space. You can do what you want to with that. The sun is smitten when the fourth trumpet is blown. 
A third of the sun is smitten, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. That's Revelation 8, 12. And an angel flies through heaven saying, whoa, 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 three woes. Things have gotten bad. When that third, when that, when the first bowl begins, the the set, the fifth trumpet is sounded, and there's a great plague of locusts. Now I don't know about you when I hear locusts, I think grasshoppers, don't you? But these things ain't run of the mill grasshoppers, from what I read here. These locusts come up out of the bottomless pit. John said, "I saw a star fall down from heaven, and a key was given to the bottomless pit, and he opened it up." And when he opened this bottomless pit, the Bible says that the smoke fills the air and darkens the sky. He says, out of this bottomless pit come these locust creatures. Their shapes are like horses. It's a big locust, isn't it? It says they have crowns of gold on their head and faces like men. It says their hair was as the hair of women. They had teeth like lions, breastplates of iron, and tails like scorpions. I don't want to run into one of these things. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard people say that that might be a helicopter, and John may never seen a helicopter. Maybe, I don't know. But I do know this. When you read about angels, there's some strange-looking angels, aren't they? I mean, there's angels that's mentioned who have a face on four different sides. Face of a man, a face of an eagle, a thought, face of a, an ox, a face of a, of a... Which one did I leave that? Face of a man. I'll just go with that. Ox. Let's see. A lion, an ox, a, a man, and an eagle. There we go. Strange creatures. Seraphim that fly around the throne. Six wings. Strange creatures. I, I, I think these things are demonic creatures that come out. I really do. And probably twisted about how evil they are. But what, regardless of what they are, they hurt men for five months, all except for the 144,000. They can't touch them. They can seal with God. Their king was Apollyon. The word Apollyon uh, means uh, destroyer. You know who that is? That's the devil. He's the one who opens up that bottomless pit. The one who fell down from heaven. I think about what Jesus said about the destroyer. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that they might have life. He's come to destroy wouldn't you hate to be around something like this? The second woe that the angel that said three woes. Here's the second woe. A plague of supernatural horsemen. Now, it's very interesting if you study angels. Now, there's fallen angels that are free on the earth right now. You read the New Testament, you see where people were possessed by demons. Fallen angels. Remember the one who uh, possessed that, that mad man and the demons asked not to be sent to the abyss. They asked to be uh, put into the swine and the swine run off the cliff. Y'all remember that? The kid who was foaming and fell down to the ground, that was demons. The Bible says we strive not against principalities of powers, but forces of darkness. And it talks about high places. I believe there's a lot of demon-possessed people probably in high places in this world. In all Amen. Places. All right. It's very interesting when the devil's mentioned a few times in the Old Testament. He's called the King of Tyre in one place, the commercial hub of that day. He called the Prince of Persia in another place. Persia certainly was a world power at the time. And then his seat was in Pergamos in the first book of Revelation, uh, first part of Revelation, when it's describing those seven churches in Asia. Certainly he is working right now through the people, and there's angels who are fallen angels that are working in men. But also, there's another group of angels that are bound up. Now, these must be some nasty individuals. I mean, some of them are running loose. These right. ones that are chained must be some bad hombres. See? There's a group that are bound under the Euphrates River, these fallen angels. They're loose. When that sixth trumpet is blasted and they slay a third part of men. That's Revelation 9, 13 through 19. And as all this is going on, God does have some witnesses there. He has 144,000, but he also has two witnesses that appear on the scene. Yeah. And there's a lot of debate. Who's the two witnesses? I was kidding with Brother Byron who was preaching in the park. I said, maybe the Lord will let us be the two witnesses. That's Tim and Byron. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just saying. Now, most people think that it's 
Moses and Elijah. Now, nobody knows. Anybody says they know who it is, they don't. But like most of the Bible, a lot of the book of Revelation, a lot of it is speculation. Not the Bible itself, but how men interpret it. Now, these two witnesses have power to shut off rain. They have fi power to breathe fire. Can you imagine being able to breathe fire and consume uh, those who try to stop them? So these men are preaching. They try to stop them and breathe fire on them. Countries try to stop them because stop the rain from falling. They're a real burden to the people. And when God allows them to be overtaken and slain, they give gifts to one another like Christmas time. They're glad these guys are gone. But I like what happens to these two witnesses. God says, finally, they've had enough fun. Come on up. And he calls them up into the heavens. That'll be an interesting one. All right. And then there's seven vials. We're talking about this. A lot of these things happen at the same time. We're not going to get into all that. I'm just going in the biblical order of the tribulation period to show you how bad it is. Now, seven vials. When the first vial is poured out, sores on, come upon all the ones who are marked with the mark of the beast. From the sole of the foot to the top of the head. And those sores stink. Literally. Chapter 16, verse 2 of Revelation. The sea, all the sea becomes his blood. Already a third part of it has become blood. Now all of it is blood. And all creatures in the sea die according to chapter 16, verse 3. The rivers and the fountains become blood in chapter 16, verses seven, 4 through 7. The fountains. You're not going to go find something to drink. The sun's heat increases in chapter 16, verse 8, when the fourth vial is poured out. And when the fifth vial is poured out, there's darkness. And this darkness evidently is more than just blackness of the sky. It says that the men gnaw their tongues in pain. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. It don't sound good to me. Do you? That's chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. And then, and the sixth vial is poured out. The Euphrates River is dried up to make the way for the kings of the east. See, what's happening here is God's gathering together all the nations of the world to fight. The Bible says that three evil spirits go forth, frogs cast out of the Antichrist's mouth, and they go and they start speaking in the ears of all the kings to draw them together to a great battle. And this great battle is going to take place in the plains of Megiddo. You ever heard the term Armageddon? That's where all nations gather together against Israel and against God. They're going to try to just swap them off the planet. But God's got other plans, folks. We'll get to that in Revelation 19. But when the seventh vial is poured out, there's the greatest earthquake that has ever taken place, takes place. The foundations of the earth are shaken. There's a great hail comes forth. Uh, it says uh, that, that if you... If you if you look into how much a, a talent weighs, these hailstones weigh between 86 and 120 pounds. That's a pretty big hailstone. Years ago, I got my roof replaced because it was golf ball size hail hit that roof and dimpled it up. But I could not imagine, and I'm going with the, the conservative number, 86 pounds of ice falling from the sky. Now, I just took you through the plagues of Revelation as fast as I could. We could study that some other time verse by verse and look into all the little nooks and crannies of the book of Revelation. But the thing I wanted you to catch, why I went through it so fast, is to show you how bad it is. You might say, well, you're interpreting it literally. There's a lot of figurative things in there. Well, if it's figurative, it's still bad, ain't it? I mean, if you speak figuratively, if you're speaking of something that's in reality, and you're actually going to fall short on explaining what's going to happen in reality. I do take the Bible literally myself. I take Revelation very literally, unless Amen. there's symbolic language. I don't find very much symbolic language in a lot of places in it. But the fact is, it's going to be a bad time. Jesus said himself, it'll be the worst time upon the face of the earth. Ever was or ever will be. That ought to be an encouragement for you to be saved and avoid it. Huh? That ought to help you make the right decision to, to seek Christ while he may be found. 
While he's drawing you into salvation uh, to come nigh to him and accept him as your personal Savior. You say, preacher, are you trying to scare me into being saved? Well, if that's what it takes, that's what I'm going to do. And by the way, that's biblical. Jude 22 and 24 says, Of some have compassion, making the difference. Others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Amen. If fear will pull you out of the fire, I'm going to use it. Will you be saved? Will you avoid this? Will you flee from the wrath to come through the Lord Jesus Christ alone? Today is the day of salvation, folks. Yes. Save the days. Let's pray.